from Mile High Report. You can find him on Twitter at John Heath NFL. John, good evening, sir. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. All right. Well, hey, I wanted to start with you talking about the offensive line. It seems to be on everybody, the tip of everybody's tongues when it comes about the Broncos. So far, your observations of the offensive line, have they locked in any of these guys? Are, are there? I mean, other than Luis Vasquez, uh, do you believe that they've locked in or are they still sort of si- shifting things around and still trying to figure it out? Outside of Louis, I don't think they are locked in. I know that Ty is who they want at the at left tackle. And on the first day, Roy struggled, but I think that since then he's gotten a little better each day. I think he may be the closest guy to be getting locked in. But I think at a left guard, there I don't think – Ben Garland's going to be able to hold on to that job. And over on the right side, uh, right now, it's Ryan Harris. And um, he seems like he's been the guy. But I'm not I'm not sold on him beating out Schofield or everyone else. I think what they're going to do is they're going to go into preseason and switch things up a little bit, move some guys around. And I think after one or two preseason games, after moving guys around, if they still don't have a unit that they're confident with, I think then – we could see them add someone that's not on the team right now. But either way, regardless of what happens, I don't think what the line, the starting lineup right now, I do not believe will be their week one lineup. Well, that's my basically my next question. You know, last year you saw seven, seven different configurations of the offensive line. You, they, you imagine they learned some lessons from that, right? I mean, that they're not wanting to do that, not wanting to be that unsettled. Or do you think because there's so much – uh, so much to learn right now with this offensive line. You may see something like that this season again. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's going to be very fluid right now, especially going into the preseason. But I think that once they get into the season, they want to get it settled down. During the season, obviously, they don't want it to be moving around like that. But I think right now, and even in the preseason, they're okay with moving guys around because they want to find – a group of guys, a group of guys that will mesh together well that they can ride through the season with. So I think they're trying to avoid it happening in the season. So they're doing things like that now. Well, let's take a stick with that offensive line. It, it appears that almost day by day, and we're only five days in, but it, it's remarkable. Uh, Max Garcia, r- rookie out of Florida, seems to be absolutely rocketing uh, up the the Broncos. Uh, maybe not, not their depth chart since they haven't released one certainly with regards to attention. And he's been essentially uh, attached to Luis Vasquez by the hip. Could the Broncos legitimately start Tyson Brylow and Max Garcia, two rookies on the left-hand side on week one? Is that even a consideration, or is that something that even if they feel as their two best players, they won't do out of fear because of the lack of experience? I think that it is something that's possible. I don't know what the team specifically is thinking, but I think it is something that's possible because, like I said earlier, I don't think Garland's going to be able to hold on to that guard spot. And it's crazy because right now he's the, quote, starter, and he could go from being a starter to not even making the team because he's really a guy that only plays that one position. And I think they're going to want someone like Garcia, who's kind of a swing guy that can play more than one position. It gives them flexibility on the line it's really nice to be able to plug guys in at more than one position so yeah I think he is a guy they could have two two rookies starting even on the same side of the line I think that is a possibility because of the uh the flexibility of somebody like Garcia chatting with John Heath from Mile High Report uh, let, let's move into some of the the bubble guys you know one of the cool things about training camp is following these storylines right the guys that kind of go stock up stock down I mean you know who's going to make the team but there's always a, a few players on the fringe uh, guys that they keep coming up, of course, are like Solomon Patton uh, or uh, jo- Jordan. Um, uh, sorry, I'm spa- spacing his name. Uh, Norwood. Nor- Taylor. Uh, Taylor. Oh, Taylor. Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jordan yeah, Taylor, Norwood, sorry. I think. Yeah. But so th- these are some of the guys that are that are sort of on the fringe uh, of these guys who have sort of made that push, and you feel uh, better about looking at them on this roster. And some who are some of the guys that you you just don't don't really see it. Uh, the two guys you just mentioned, Patton and Taylor, really stuck out to me. I think between the two of them, it, if it comes down to just one of them being the final receiver, I think right now Patton would edge out Taylor. But I could see both of them ending up on the team's practice squad. If somebody else, if they get cut and someone else doesn't sign them, I could see them stashing them on the practice squad. I think those two are kind of on the bubble for getting the last spot slash practice squad spot. As far as guys that are on the bubble, that their stock's kind of going down. I think Carl Schmidt's not necessarily because of anything that he 
has done. I think his stock is just plummeting because when Britton Colquitt uh, reduced his salary, that helped him a lot. Colquitt also holds, and he does that really well. And so I think uh, Schmidt, he hasn't been consistent enough. I think he would have to have a phenomenal preseason to give uh, Colquitt any kind of competition. And at kicker, I think it's kind of the same thing. Barth uh, kicked off today, and I felt like he did the best kicking off, and he's been more accurate kicking field goals than McManus in practice. So I think McManus and Schmidt, both of them would have to have really good preseasons in my mind for them to be able to make the team. Looking over at the running back position, of course, we know the C.J. Anderson, Monte Ball, Juwan Thompson. These guys are locks, essentially. Ronnie Hillman and Capri Bibbs, to my mind, and maybe you can correct me if, if you see something differently, appear to be in a battle for the final halfback spot. You're going to see less because there's a fullback going to make this roster this year. What are the pros and cons of each of those, and how do you feel that that might break down? I actually think that Jeremy Stewart may be pushing both Bibbs yeah. and Hillman. I think Stewart has been running really well, and I think they like him. I think Stewart is kind of a sleeper to watch. I think if Stewart has a really good preseason, he could upset both Bibbs and Hillman. But Hillman is such an interesting situation because you wouldn't really look at him as anything more than the third the third running back. And even right now we're talking about him as a bubble guy. But there's times in practice when he runs with the first-team offense. So he's an interesting guy. I'm really curious to see how what kind of reps they give him in preseason, what kind of reps they give Bibbs and Stewart in preseason. I think uh, preseason, I think, will determine a lot how the running backs shake out because there's only so much you can see in practice. I think how they perform in the games will help uh, sort things out. John, last one for I have for you. Thanks again for your time tonight. Let's talk about Brock Osweiler for just a, l- a little bit. A different sort of thing happening this year in training camp the fact that every fourth or fifth day he's going to be the guy leading the ones. And I guess that's good news for him because he gets, you know, actual reps with, with the first team. But uh, on the flip side of that, of course, you know, that, that's, that's time without Peyton Manning. What do the Broncos need to see out of Brock Osweiler in order to feel good about signing him to an extension? Or is it uh, as simple as it, it, does, it doesn't seem to matter because John Elway's already made – uh, made the, the signing, the, basically the drafting of him in the second round, such a big part of the future of the Broncos. I think at practice, Andrew Mason today made a really good point. He said, with Brock and with everyone, it's never as good as it seems or never as bad as it seems. And I think mm-hmm. Brock, uh, in practice, and even when he, he got to run with the ones, he had some ups and downs. He had some passes into the dirt. He overthrew a couple of guys. But he also did some nice things well, like he had some nice rollouts, some nice bootlegs and things. So I think in practice, he's going to have some ups and downs. I think from practice, I don't think they can really base and know if they want to give him an extension or not. I think the only way they can determine something like that is give him playing time, at the very least in preseason, and ideally give him some, even some starts and some real games. I would not feel confident offering him a long-term deal without seeing him play in some real games. Uh or maybe just give him like a, a two-year extension if they really like how he does in camp and then go from there. John, really great stuff. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, John Heath from Mile High Report. Find him on Twitter. He's a really good follow. Uh, John Heath NFL from Mile High Report. They do a great job. 